Welcome to Cambridge Forum. I'm Pat Zerke, the director of the forum, and I am delighted to welcome you all here tonight for a lively discussion with journalist and author Masha Gessen, talking about Putin's war against the West. Our forum tonight will be led by Alexandra Vakru, executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. Masha Gessen is a Russian-American journalist, author, and activist. Her account of Vladimir Putin's rise to power and its devastating impact on the nascent democratic government of Russia, the man without a face, the unlikely rise of Vladimir Putin, opened a window into the changing culture of Russia as well as the nature of its powerful and enigmatic leader. Her newest book, Words Will Break Cement, The Passion of Pussy Riot, recounts the arrest, trial, and imprisonment of the female punk rock group. Gessen identifies as a lesbian, has written extensively on LGBT rights, and helped found the Pink Triangle Campaign in Moscow. Sometime described as Russia's leading LGBT rights activist, Gessen voluntarily left Russia in 2013 when tightening anti-gay and lesbian policies threatened her family. I'm pleased to say that in 2008-2009, Masha Gessen held a regional fellowship at the Davis Center, a position awarded to advanced scholars, policymakers, and journalists from Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. While in residence, she conducted research on censorship in the internet era. She's the author of three previous books and has written extensively for such publications as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the New Republic, Slate, Vanity Fair, and US News and World Report. In 2013, she received the Media for Liberty Award. What do Gessen's experiences and insights tell us about Russia today? What does she hope to accomplish with her insider's account of Putin's war against the West? We're going to find out tonight. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Masha Gessen. Thank you. Um, so I actually have to um, confess <laughs> that while I was at the Davis Center, I was starting work on the, on the Putin book. But it was a secret, so I couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> and, uh, so you know, you can sort of view this talk as part of my final talk about the results of my research done at the Davis Center. Couldn't have done it without the Davis Center. Uh, and um, and I'm actually going to. I'm uh, right now. I'm working on a book on, about the Boston bombers. And then right after that, I'll start writing a book about Putin's war against the West, because I believe that. Um, the, my first book about Putin, uh, The Gift That Keeps On Giving, uh, was stopped, you know, it sort of ended in, in 2012. And I think there's been a major transformation uh, both in him and more importantly in the nature of his regime uh, in the three years since. And that's really what I'm going to talk about now briefly and what I'm going to write a book about. So um, what happened uh, just as I was finishing my book and uh, and Putin was starting his third and fourth and probably final and lifelong uh, term as president um, was that Russia was going through a period of upheaval. And when he came back, uh, I mean, you probably all know, but just let me remind you that he'd been appointed prime minister and anointed president in 1999. He was elected in a special election in which no one else had time to campaign uh, in March of 2000. And after two terms, which at the t uh, two four-year terms, which at the time was the maximum uh, amount of time allowed by the Russian constitution, he, steps, he stepped aside briefly uh, and had President Dmitry Medvedev keep his chair warm for four years. Um, part of the pact with Medvedev was that Medvedev would immediately upon coming into office pass constitutional reform that would extend the presidential term to six years. So that's what Medvedev did as soon as he came in. And so the next time Putin ran, having interpreted uh, a really uh, odd provision in the Russian constitution, the Russian constitution says that the uh, that. Uh, any person can only serve two consecutive terms as president of Russia. That in Russian can be interpreted in two ways. It can be interpreted as saying that the maximum amount of time that a president can serve is two, two four-year terms consecutively, but you can't actually serve two terms that are not consecutive. It can also be interpreted to mean you can serve consecutively only two terms, but then you can run again which is the way that Putin chose to interpret it. Yeah. 
Uh, and so after having served two terms consecutively, he stepped aside for four years, and then he came back for uh, two more, he thinks, uh, consecutive terms, but this time six-year terms. So by the time he's done, he'll be 71 years old. Uh, and he doesn't plan to be done. So, um, but what he saw when he came in uh, in what was a priori fixed election, I mean, this was an election in which nobody got on the ballot uh, except with the Kremlin's express permission, and no one who was on the ballot campaigned, right? Um, so he was assured of taking that election in addition to the fact that the precincts at that point would return whatever result was required of them. Uh, but still, when he claimed 63% of the vote, what he encountered was a very different Russia than the Russia that he had ruled previously. It was a Russia engulfed by ma mass protests. Now, this has often been called a, mass, a protest movement, which I don't think is accurate because it wasn't a movement. It didn't have the kind of coordination and level of organization that a movement should have or usually has. It was a protest culture. It was a, really a spontaneous eruption of people who had very different political beliefs, if they had them at all, uh, and different agendas for going to the protest. But it was still, it was unprecedented and it was massive. Um, it was uh, uh, portrayed by the Kremlin and unfortunately reported in this country very much as an urban protest limited to a few large cities. It's not true at all. At the height of the protests, they were happening in 99 uh, different Russian cities simultaneously. That pretty much covers Russia. And, and also saying urban protests is misleading because Russia is a nearly 80% urban country. So urban protest basically means, you know, countrywide protests. Um, and um, even though the protesters had no levers for actually affecting uh, politics in, in the country, I mean, by that point, the electoral system had been destroyed entirely. Uh, Putin didn't have to leave power, or in, is not going to have to leave power for any reason, including, you know, millions of people in the streets, if there were millions of people. Still, it was, it was very unnerving. And, uh, and I want you to imagine for a second what Putin saw when he looked at the television coverage of these protests. What he saw were not people protesting his regime, or uh, more specifically, and this was true of many people, protesting the way in which he claimed his third term, which was by saying, look, you know, Medvedev and I talked about it and we decided that I'm going to be president again, and he's going to be prime minister, which is exactly what happened. So a lot of people were protesting that. They were protesting the sort of the lack of respect inherent in the way that he was taking power again. Uh, but that's not what he saw. What he saw were people protesting the Russian state, because he could no longer see a distinction between himself and the regime, and the regime and the state. So if people were protesting the Russian state, then they were protesting Russia itself. If they were protesting Russia itself, then they had to be foreigners, which is why the first thing that Putin said about the protests was that they were personally inspired by Hillary Clinton. <laughs> uh, and then after you know, giving it a little bit of thought and saying something else that also didn't go over that well, which was that he thought that the white ribbons that people wore as a symbol of the protest culture uh, were used for phylactics that people for some reason decided to pin to their lapels, uh, which, is, you know, which is what Putin likes to do. He likes to sort of use a, lot, a little below the belt humor, uh, and he thinks it's an effective way of bonding with absolutely anybody. And I know this because <laughs> he tried that to, to bond with me as well. Uh, and um, he, um, so that, that didn't go very well, but, but this idea of using sexuality and using this rhetoric of otherness to claim the protesters actually very quickly congealed into gay baiting the protesters which worked. And the reason it worked is that uh, it, it, calling the protesters queer was actually a really great shorthand for communicating exactly what he wanted to communicate, which is that, uh, as we all know, you know, there were no gay and lesbian people in Russia before the Soviet Union collapsed. <laughs> See, you think it's funny, but it's not. There were no gay and lesbian people in Russia before the Soviet Union collapsed. There were people who, had, who loved people of the same sex. There were people who had homosexual relationships. There were people who created different families, uh, much more creative configurations than, uh, than you can find in many other countries, uh, including probably this one. Um, but there weren't people who publicly claimed 
an identity based on their sexuality and claimed a group identity based on their sexuality and claimed that they deserved human rights as a group that was united by their sexuality. So they weren't people who said they were, they were gay and lesbian. Uh, this was a clear case of a Western import that could be pointed to, you know, something that happened in the early 1990s. Uh, it was also a clear case of something that made people uncomfortable, that they were told they suddenly had to accept after a lifetime of thinking that it was wrong. So it was a brilliant rhetorical device. It was also a brilliant rhetorical device because Russians had never, ever before talked about sex. Right? Uh, Russians had lived through the 1960s, but you know, when the Western world was living through the 1960s, we had the Soviet Union, so what happened in Russia in the 1960s was that a lot of private behavior changed, but public conversation didn't change. And so what, what this gay baiting hit upon was also this sacred division between the private and the public. You know, let's not drag sexuality into the public sphere. And of course, because Russians had never talked about sexuality publicly, the moment the government started the conversation, the government owned the conversation. People didn't have a way of responding to it. They, hadn't, they didn't have a language of saying that's wrong. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was really, as propaganda devices go, it was one of the best ever invented. Um, but what was also great about it is that it tied into an entire ideology. The ideology had sort of been floating around, and, um, you know, ideologies uh, are actually much simpler things than, uh, than we often think of them as. Uh, it's really enough to have a catchy idea to, for a totalitarian or a, an authoritarian regime that aspires to being totalitarian, to grab hold of this idea and move forward with it. Um, and so this, this, this idea had been floating around. It had been uh, very f marginal at the time that Putin came into office. It had steadily moved toward the center over the time that he was in office. And now it finally took center stage. And this ideology is summarized by a man who calls himself a philosopher, whose name is Alexander Dugin, and um, what he says, he says is quite simple. He says, look, Western civilization is promoting this strange idea of universal human rights. Right? This idea uh, holds that everybody has human rights, including, and this, the, this is a quote, including post-gender and post-human people. And what he means is, well, by post-gender, post -gender, I think it, it, it's, it's clear what he means. And uh, by post-human, he means you know, some sort of specter of technologically driven, you know, transhuman, whatever it is. Um, something strange, something that we don't want, a future that we don't want, we don't want to be in. And then he says, well, fine, if, if they want to live like that, they want to lose all idea of gender and humanity, that's fine, that's their business. They just shouldn't force it upon us. They shouldn't promote these human rights as being universal. That's the problem with that idea, right? Because there's a, there are actually different civilizations in the world. And in addition to the Western civilization, there's this, the traditional value civilization. And the traditional value civilization uh, encompasses many, many different countries, but only Russia has the courage of its convictions to go to war, to really, really fight for traditional values. And this is huge. This is Russia's new national identity. Russia had lived without a national identity for nearly a quarter century. It had been pretty disastrous. In the mid-1990s, President Yeltsin formed a commission to come up with the, national, with the national identity. And the commission worked for several years and came up with nothing. Uh, and so Russia was stuck without a national identity. Um, Russia traditionally had defined itself in opposition to an enemy, that that enemy had been the United States for the last, you know, the, the 40 years post-World War II. Then in the early 90s, suddenly the United States was no longer an, the enemy. Who was? Well, it wasn't clear. Now, finally, it's clear it's the gays, it's gay Europa, which is the new Russian word for Europe. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's the United States which promotes this whole you know, bizarre idea of universal human rights. And that's how, uh, that, that's how gay baiting the protesters suddenly becomes something huge, something that justifies the war in Ukraine. 
right? Because, uh, and this is, this is something, it's, uh, I find this very interesting, that it's very difficult for Western reporters to write about this. And I understand why it's so difficult to write about it. Because it's really difficult to report with a straight face something that you think is patently ridiculous, right? How are you going to write in the New York Times, uh, if you're not a columnist, that, uh, that Russia claims to be fighting uh, American homo-fascists in Ukraine? But that's, that's what it's, they say on television, right? Uh, and um, the, during the first parliamentary discussion of what was going on in Ukraine, which came uh, in the middle of December of last, last year, uh, so about a month into the protests in Ukraine, and the, again, just, just a quick reminder, what had happened in Ukraine was that Ukraine was supposed to sign an association agreement with the European Union at the last minute the very sort of Russia-allied president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, backed out unilaterally of this agreement without any kind of public discussion. And this created a very strange uh, and fortuitous coalition in Ukraine of people who were pro-Western, people who were anti-Russian, and people who were just really upset about not having uh, been consulted in any way. And uh, so there, this the, resulted in mass protests. and. Um, the Russian parliament, the chairman of the foreign relations committee in the Russian parliament, in, in introducing the first resolution that the Russian parliament passed on this, said, we have to understand the danger inherent in this. If Ukraine goes west, this will expand the sphere of influence of gay culture, which is the official agenda of the European Union. Right? So, that's how you know this anti-gay uh, rhetoric suddenly turns into something as as huge as, as the war in Ukraine. Um, but it's also uh, it's what 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 Putin is doing recently has uh, often been misrepresented and oversimplified, uh, even though it's really difficult to oversimplify it. But it still has been oversimplified as um, uh, as no uh, Soviet nostalgia, as wanting to go back to the Soviet Union. And actually the reason, uh, some of you may know that this talk was originally billed as back to the past and I asked to, be, uh, to, to have that changed because I think it's really important to understand that ideologies generally are forward-looking, right? Ideologies are ideas of historical movement. Right, of, of, of a process that's underway that, uh, that this particular regime is, 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 is moving forward. And so this is not nostalgia. This is not about recreating the Soviet Union. This idea of a Russian world, which is another term that's been used for this traditional value civilization, it's expansive, it's borderless, uh, and that means it's also not circumscribed by the borders of the former Soviet Union. And it, it, it imagines all sorts of alliances. One of the really important alliances that it imagines and has are the alliances with the European far right. right? So these are uh, political parties and political organizations that are extremely conservative, so that's the traditional values part, and are anti-European Union. And incredibly, that dovetails really well with, with, with Putin, Putin's rhetoric. One example of, of such an organization uh, with, that fascinates me is the, the, this political party that has recently become part of the Finnish parliament called the True Finns or the Real Finns. Uh, and they say, look, you know, Finland had more freedom as part of the Russian, more independence as part of the Russian Empire, which it was until 1918. Uh, than it does now as part of the European Union. As part of the Russian Empire, it had its own currency. It had its own parliament that could pass laws without consulting with the higher power. And this is true. That was, that was the model of, of Finland's existence in, uh, within the Russian Empire. So if we became part of Greater Russia again, we'd have more freedom than we would with the, uh, within the European Union, we'd have our own currency and we could reclaim our traditional values which the European Union will not let us do. Right? And so this is how we see this really absurd sounding idea of this clash of civilizations between the traditional value civilization and Western civilization actually finding a voice in Western Europe and one of the more liberal countries as we're used to thinking about it uh, in, uh, in Western Europe and giving Russia more of a sense of, uh, of sort of its, its role in the world uh, by, you know, by forming these alliances. And uh, these, it's also an alliance with, with the ruling party in Hungary, with Marie Le Pen in France. You know, these are all 
people who who love this 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 new Russian rhetoric. So. Um, I, uh, two things I want to mention that I sort of skipped over. Actually, uh, one thing that I skipped over is, is of course Pussy Riot. Where do, where's the where, where's the place of Pussy Riot and all this? Um, I have to admit that when I finished the first Putin book, I thought, and I told my publisher that the next book I was going to write was going to be a book about the decline and fall of Vladimir Putin. And the reason for that was that I was finishing it in December 2011, so just as the protests got underway. And um, uh, and this is, it's it's an interesting lesson for me in sort of journalistic bias because uh, well for one thing I learned that you should never write an epilogue to a book uh, within a, a few weeks of the books coming out because actually you know you kind of need to let things settle before writing them up. Uh, but the other thing I learned is that. Um, there's um, you know there, there's a sort of heuristic uh, I'd covered revolutions. I, I guess I'd covered other protests as well, but the ones I remembered really well were the successful ones, the revolutions, right? So I thought this really feels like one of them, uh, and I kind of didn't think about uh, whether other protests that hadn't been as successful had also felt like revolutions when you're in the middle of it. At the time, in December of 2011, it really felt like this was so huge that there was no way this wasn't going to cause lasting change. And um, I have to say that Pussy Riot, uh, and uh, actually, actually I should say that Pussy Riot are not a punk rock group, right? Pussy Riot are a performance protest art collective that, among other things, created the persona of a punk rock group that at the beginning did not include a single musician. It was a totally fictional character, right? That staged this protest, and that's what made the, the, this collective famous. The collective is, it's an open membership, anonymous collective. So uh, it's, it's completely amorphous. There are many people whom I interviewed for the book who no one has ever heard of, who have ever, the, the same rights to, be, to claim to have been Pussy Riot as the people who were unmasked and, and arrested and sent to jail. But anyway, the people who were participating in those protests, in the Pussy Riot protests, were, I think, much wiser to what was going on than I was. And they felt it was really essential to push the bounds of that protest. And that's what they did when they went into the Cathedral of Christ the Savior on February 21st, 2012, two weeks before Putin claimed re-election. And they went in to protest the symbiosis of church and state. Uh, and at the time, that symbiosis was as evident as, as, as it has ever been. The, uh, the, because Putin felt nervous, he, as Russian dictators have always done, called on the Russian Orthodox Church to step in and help him. And so the patriarch of the church was campaigning for him, rather unsubtly comparing, uh, compa comparing him to God. And uh, also telling people, uh, telling parish, uh, parish priests were telling people not to go to protests because Russian Orthodox believers do not participate in protests. That's apparently a commandment specific to Russian Orthodox believers. Uh, and um, so Pussy Riot went into the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, which is the most official, the most gaudy, the biggest cathedral in Russia, and lip synced and played air guitar for 40 seconds. Uh, and as a result, were sentenced to two years, and those of them who were identified were sent sentenced to two years in jail. At the time, they were the first people in Russia to go to jail for peaceful protest, uh, to, go, to be sentenced to actual jail time, you know, not 10 days administrative arrest, but actual jail time for peaceful protest. It seems unbelievable now, less than three years later, because there are so many people who face that, right? But it was a real turning point. And another way in which it was a turning point was that, you know, I think at this point, the performance that Pussy Riot staged began when they went into the cathedral and ended with their closing statements in court six months later. And one of their greatest accomplishments was drawing out the nature of the regime in their trial. And uh, the nature of that regime was, well, you know, it became very, very clear. Uh, and I had a very difficult time editing the chapter in the book that was almost entirely a transcript of just the first day of hearings. Because there was no way to throw anything out because it was all so important. And that's when the book sort of ballooned into a regular-sized book. It was originally supposed to be a thin paperback. Um, and um, 
so the, they were accused of felony hooliganism. Felony hooliganism is a, well, hooliganism is a crude disruption of social order. And what makes it a felony is if it's motivated by enmity for a particular social group. So they were essentially accused of committing a felony hate crime against Russian Orthodox believers, which is a little odd because the Russian Orthodox believers are a majority in Russia. But uh, in the trial, they were really accused of blasphemy. And the victims and witnesses who were paraded in front of the court and um, uh, th so this was, the, the, this was, this was uh, a felony crime in which they were supposed to be victims. So the victims testified that they had been so traumatized as to be unable to work by either witnessing the performance or watching it on YouTube over and over again. <laughs> and, and just a couple of examples uh, from the trial. The, um, at one point, one of the witnesses said that they went up on stage, uh, not on stage, they went up on a platform in front of the altar and they started engaging in devilish jerkings. And one of the defense attorneys, and the defense attorneys were no better than the prosecution, they, uh, they, uh, one of the defense attorneys said, I would like to know how the witness knows that their, those jerkings were devilish. How does she know how the, devils, the devil jerks? Has she seen the devil? Another witness went up to testify that they were possessed. And the judge said, I'm not going to allow that because the witness does not have a medical degree and cannot render a diagnosis of possession. <laughs> and this is all absolutely hilarious, except it was happening in the largest city in Europe in August 2012. Uh, and it made very clear that Russia was resolved to go back into the Middle Ages, which is exactly what it's doing. So to, 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 to finish my, part, uh, my monologue, uh, I just want to say that, that this always raises the question of what Putin's plan is, right? What's he going to do next? You know, what's, what's going to become the next part of the Russian world? And, um, and I think it's really important to understand in dealing with Putin that he doesn't have a plan. I mean, decisions in the Kremlin are made on a day-by-day, minute-by-minute basis. Uh, but while he had, doesn't have a plan, there are many plans available to him. And the way that works is that for the last 15 years, literally since the moment Putin became the leader of Russia, even before he became acting president, um, Putin has been pouring money into the defense budget. Right? And pouring all sorts of resources into remilitarizing Russia. What that has resulted in is actually a succession of changes to the Russian military doctrine, which, and the last of these changes, this is brilliant, the last of these changes are classified. We don't know what has been done to the Russian military doctrine in the last few months. But the previous changes basically kept revising Russia's uh, stance to, to, in the direction of becoming more aggressive and revising the conditions for the, uh, the possibility of first strike by Russia, including first nuclear strike. Um, but also, there's been a huge army of, uh, of generals and other high-ranking officers making up plans, right? That's what they do with this huge military budget. And it's a very bureaucratized institution, so they have to draw up a lot of plans uh, for annexing and invading all sorts of places that are near them, right? And we saw that very clearly with Crimea, right? Because uh, the annexation of Crimea was something that was clearly decided in the course of a day, maybe a few days. But it had also, just as clearly from what we saw from the, of the military operation, very well planned out. And that's because that plan was available. It was sitting on somebody's desk. Uh, and so the decision-making process is basically pointing at the thing that seems to fit the current situation best. We're also seeing expressions of that in the incredible increase in the number and aggressiveness of Russian military exercises, right? So every country that's anywhere near Russia, including the United States, um, is reporting increased act uh, Russian military activity, exercise activity around its borders. Um, and of course, we've seen Russia as part of its nuclear exercises violating the 1989 nuclear treaty for the first time since it was signed. 
right, by using a nuclear tip weapon in a, in a nuclear in a military exercise, which hadn't been done and which is forbidden by the, by the treaty. That's also an expression of those plans. You know, that's that's how the system works. Is that behind every exercise, there is a plan uh, for how this exercise can actually turn into actual action. And I, I would argue that these plans drawn up by the defense ministry are like Chekhov's gun. Uh, on, on, on the wall. If it hangs on the wall during the first act, it is going to fire during the third act. So we just have to see which of the plans fires. Thank you. On the nature of Putin's regime at the moment, would you say that the regime is one of increasingly tight controls and effective manipulation of both administrative and political structures? Or was Masha from Pussy Riot correct in saying that the regime is a show that conceals what in reality is chaos? What looks orderly and restrictive is in fact disorganized and inefficient. Um, can I say it's both? <laughs> because because I, think, I, don't, I don't think there's a contradiction between tight controls and, uh, uh, and chaos. In fact, I think that the more sort of subjectively you perceive chaos, the more you want to impose tight controls. So there's, um, I think that the best way to, uh, that I have found to understand the progress of the regime is to imagine this uh, very simple but very violent machine, you know, something like, I don't know, maybe an excavator with, with teeth that has been set in a single direction and it is unstoppable. Right. And the, the, the further it moves, the more stuff it will eat up. And it's, it's programmed to gobble up everything that has anything to do with liberty and independence. Right. If it sees something that's alive, it's going to gobble it up. And, and, it's, and it's irreversible. And how, just how irreversible it is, is a measure of how uncontrolled the system is. Right? The system has a vector, but it doesn't have a design. Right. So it's, it's both tight and, and controlled and disorderly at the same time. All right. I'd like to invite the audience to come up and ask questions if you have them. I'll ask another one while you're warming up. Um, there's a follow-on to this, mm -hmm. this idea um, about freedom in Russia today and what kind of freedom there is. The ability to express oneself in a demonstration or in the media or in a blog is increasingly limited. And yet the sheer size and sophistication of the country makes it possible for determined citizens to find each other and share views of many kinds. More philosophically, Masha, when she was making her statement in court, quoted the French students in 1968 saying, my cause may be hopeless, but I find freedom in the responsibility that I take on. And Nadia joined her, we have more freedom than the people who are sitting opposite us on the side of the accusers because we can say what we want and we can do what we want. What is the nature of freedom in Russia today? I am humbled by, you know, being a block down from uh, Svetlana Boim's house and, and she's written an entire book about this called Another Freedom. Uh, I, uh, what is the nature of freedom in Russia today? Well, the, the, Hannah Arendt writes about totalitarian societies as depriving uh, individuals of freedom more effectively than tyrannies de deprive individuals of freedom by collapsing the distance uh, that people have from one another. Uh, and I think that's, that's a process that's very much uh, un underway in Russia. Russia is on its way to becoming a totalitarian society, which means that the, uh, the, the space available for self-expression is contracting constantly. It's, 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 a, it's, the, it's a lived experience for everybody who is concerned about this in Russia to feel the space contracting. And I would argue that that, you know, that subjective experience of having space contract around you is probably more traumatic and more limiting than the experience of never having had the space in the first place. Hmm? Thank you. You can take our first question. Please come very close to the microphone. Hello, my name is Zala. I am an exchange student from Higher School of Economics, studying at the Fletcher School now. Um, and I'm also an alumna of the FLEX program, which has been banned recently. And I've read both versions, uh, the Russian version and the version written by you in New York Times. So The New Yorker. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so actually, um, I have my own position, and I think that we are, we, we as members of this program are um, cultural ambassadors. So once we were selected, and it was a very tough selection process, once we were selected, we kind of 
you know, signed an agreement that we are ambassadors, we have responsibilities, and we should put our priorities aside, and we'd rather should, you know, learn all the good things uh, from the United States and bring it back and kind of spread it, spread the, the values. So my understanding was that um, uh, I actually did not like the whole story, and I thought the, the boy was wrong in his decision to, you know, to think about, uh, you know, his life rather than, you know, his his priorities rather than the priorities of the program, because it's, you know, we are ambassadors. So um, I would like to hear your comment and your thoughts. Maybe maybe it's con controversial, but I'm very interested to learn more. Masha, could you give a little background on the yes, story? Yes, absolutely. Also? I'll do Thank that. You. Yeah. I'm so glad to have a question like that. Usually, you know, <laughs> it's very unusual to get a new question. Uh, so that, uh, that's great. Um, so to give you some background, uh, Flex is was a program that ran, I think, for 21 years. It's a program. Uh, it's a U.S. funded. Uh, it's called an exchange program, which it really isn't because it was a one-way program. Russians and other post-Soviet countries sent high school students for a year uh, of family-based high school study in the United States. Uh, they were called Future Leaders Exchange. Future Leaders Exchange. Right. So, but again, the Future Leaders were all, uh, all, all, all from there, none, none from here, going to Russia. Um, and um, it was shut down in... I think uh, September of this year by Russia as a result of something that, that happened a few months earlier, which was that one of the students, uh, a boy who was in Michigan, uh, asked for political asylum on the basis of his sexual orientation in, uh, in the United States. By asking for political asylum, he uh, automatically ended up in federal custody in the United States, who is now the, the federal custody program placed him with a foster, a federally certified foster family, with which he is now staying, uh, waiting for his asylum application to go through. Now, uh, Russians, when they talked about this, uh, described this as an illegal adoption of uh, of a boy who had living parents in Russia. And of course, an adoption like that would indeed be illegal. Uh, that's not actually what's happening in this case. He applied for asylum first and then ended up with a foster family second as part of his federal custody program. How old is he? he is 17 now. He was 16 when he, when, when he applied for asylum. Uh, so the... Uh, that's a really interesting question. You know, uh, when does an individual have the right to claim uh, his personal interests uh, over the interests of a program that has funded him? I mean, I think that being selected and being funded for the program is a little bit of a tricky argument since it's, the program is fully funded by the United States. Uh, but um, but I would actually set that aside because I think there's a much more important and clear-cut idea that has to do with political asylum. And the way that this country and all other countries that grant political asylum treat it is that the fear of political and, uh, and personal persecution trumps everything else. And trumps the terms on which you enter a country. So you can enter a country on a tourist visa and it will be illegal for you to stay in this country past the time that you're, uh, uh, that you're allowed to unless you had a well-founded fear of persecution. Right, and that this is something that this is an idea that all countries that grant political asylum sign on to, is that political fear of political persecution trumps absolutely everything. So, in my opinion, it of course trumps his responsibility to his high school exchange program. He is claiming that he has a well-founded fear uh, for his personal safety and security if he goes back to Russia. From my personal experience and from the experience of, of many people I know, he is telling the truth. So talking about unusual questions, by the year 2016, uh, Putin will not have enough 18-year-olds to fulfill requirements for the army. And if they're not 14, uh, 16 now, they're not going to be 18 in any type, shape, or form in a couple of years. I would ask you to guess if he, where is he going to hire, from which country, and how is he going to fulfill that? Yeah. Well, uh, preparations are actually in place for that. I mean, uh, Russia has passed a series of, of amendments to, to legislation that make it possible to draft uh, 
anyone uh, who is in, in the Russian parlance vayenna abyazhne, which means owes a debt to the uh, Russian army. That's uh, a lot of people with, who have higher education who ha didn't serve in the army got an exemption while they were uh, getting their higher education. They remain uh, conscriptable until the age of something like 40, I think. Uh, they can also do what they did during the war in Afghanistan when they ran out of people. That was the last demographic dip. Uh, the reason that Russians are not going to have enough 18-year-olds in a couple of years is because Russia is, in, um, uh, is facing one of its uh, generation-long demographic dips that happened after World War II, right? So, um, so, uh, so, so what they did during the last dip in the 1980s was basically abolish the ex all the exemptions. So people who are in college, people who are not physically fit to serve, they're all going to be conscripted. That, that's, that's a lot of people. And the next question I wanted to ask you is, um, I'm beginning not to see any noticeable difference between Soviet Union of 1970s and Putin's Russia today. Um, you know, I don't really like that line of argument. I mean, I think it's interesting sort of as an intellectual exercise, but I also think it's dead end because actually we can find a lot of differences. The question is how significant are those differences? Because I don't want to get into a conversation about whether the internet is better than Radio Liberty when it was just on radio, right? Uh, or maybe it's worse because you're not going to get answers to questions that you don't ask uh, on the internet, but you did on Radio Liberty. Uh, and certainly there was censorship, uh, you know, full force censorship in the Soviet Union. There isn't officially censorship in, in Russia now, right? So we can get into all these distinctions. How useful are they? I mean, we're looking at a country that is moving toward totalitarianism. I would again argue that the vector of movement is, is extremely important, losing freedom is a much less pleasant experience than living in stagnation or in a, in a country that's softly sort of allowing people to do a little bit more every with every passing year. Uh, so that's why I specifically asked for significant differences. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. You can take the next question. So I apologize in advance because my question is quite general. But um, given that Russia is approaching a totalitarian more totalitarian state, and things are becoming hotter with annexation and whatnot in Ukraine. Do you think that there's a possibility for World War III? Yes. I apologize for giving you no, one please. syllable, yeah, one yeah. syllable uh, answer, I but yes. Yeah. <laughs> Under what extent, like to, to which extent, do you think that it'll be a hot war? Are we entering World War III or Cold War II? Um, well, I, you know, I, I try, especially since predicting that Putin was going to fall uh, this year. I'm, I've, I've tried to be careful about making predictions. <laughs> so I would just say that um, let's, let's look at what we've seen in the last year, mm. right? What we have seen is, uh, is the first forcible annexation of land in Europe since World War II, right? So that's, uh, that's the destruction of the post-World War II order right there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have seen an absolutely intractable uh, counterpart to the West in, in Putin. I mean, he, uh, he's impossible to negotiate with. Not even, I would say, not so much because he lies, but because as the bully that he is, he just claims the right to say whatever he wants whenever he feels like it. And it doesn't have to, do any, any, to have anything to do with, with reality by definition. Right, I mean, he's like that guy in the playground who says, you know, what pencil case? I don't see any pencil case. This pencil case? I don't see the pencil case. Yeah, that, that's, that's sort of the level of the conversation. Uh, so, the, so the question you're asking is, you know, knowing that, how much is he capable of? Well, how much does he need to be capable of, right? To, he's addicted his, to his popularity. His only goal is to, is to retain power in Russia. He doesn't have, and this is where a lot of Western analysts go wrong, he doesn't have the goal of maintaining the Russian economy. He doesn't have the goal of maintaining the Russian uh, population. He doesn't have the goal of protecting Russia's borders in any significant way for any significant amount of time. He only has the day-to-day -day goal of maintaining power. If to maintain power he needs to mobilize the population in an ever-escalating fashion, he will do that. And if that means 
having more and more wars on, ma on more and more fronts, that's what will happen. So. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank you for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. Um, so based on your writings, um, it's clear that you don't have a fatalistic view of society in Russia. And based on your statements about 2011 and 2012, it's pretty clear that you don't share the same kind of narrative of vast apathy in terms of the Russian people. Um, so with that in mind, where do you see the impact of civil society programs, promotion of action and mobilization, like Okrita Rossiya, um, Novalny's work, um, and programs like this, and how would you compare those to the kind of impetus that's being imposed by sanctions from the West? Um, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Uh, and you know, you said so many nice things about me in the beginning, it's very difficult for me to say, look, there's just no hope. Uh, although that's what I think. But, um, um, but I think uh, there's um, uh, there's a real problem with 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 the sort of the the uh, the civil society the emphasis on civil society and cultural change that has been in place for much of the last two decades. Uh, and the problem is that on the one hand, sort of on the, in, on the individual level level, they matter a lot, right? I mean, there are people you know who've gone on, who've been on the flex program. There are people who uh, have received funding from you know anybody from George Soros to to USAID, uh, whose lives were profoundly changed by the experience, and who in turn changed other people's lives profoundly, right? Um, even without that, you know, people who participated in municipal elections in Moscow last year, I think, received an extremely important political and life experience that I certainly don't want to devalue by, by anything. At the same time, the, um, I mean, the sanctions uh, from the uh, from the United States they haven't really affected the civil society programs, right? That's what Russians have done, and. And of course, Russians are happy to impose sanctions on their own internal enemies, right? Uh, and then sort of pass them off as uh, the sanctions imposed by the United States. It's it's a win-win proposition uh, for the Kremlin. Uh, but if we sort of set set that aside and say, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, just but just how bad is that development? How much emphasis should we place now on civil society program programs? I think that it's probably time to admit that while these programs are very important for individuals, they're not going to affect change. You know, this is a closed system that, that Putin has built. And the only thing that can happen to a closed system is, is that it can implode. And the problem is you, know, it, uh, you cannot speed up the imploding of the system by funding individuals. You can significantly improve the lives of those individuals, but that n may not be the best application of resources at this point. So in that case, in terms of 2011 and 2012, do you foresee, without, again, <laughs> avoiding forecasting, um, that another crisis would, would precipitate mass mobilization? I don't think so, uh, because the equation has really changed. Um, I mean, what um, the, the, the protests, and we can talk more you know, if we get a chance about the protests of 2011 2012, because they're very unusual protests, right? Uh, have I lost the mic? Yeah. Thank you. But um, sort of setting that aside for a second, uh, what has happened uh, since Putin came back to, into power is he's taken away the hope that was inherent in those protests, however unrealistic it was. People really felt that if they came out, maybe that would affect some sort of change. A lot of that hope was really misinformed. A lot of it was sort of looking at Ukraine and saying, look, you know, if Ukraine could, could do it with the Orange Revolution, we can do it. Uh, and that is sort of completely missing the point that Ukraine was a, uh, has been for the last 20 years a country with a transitional form of government which had dormant democratic institutions that can be jump-started with mass protests, which is what happened in 20, uh, 2004, and I think what happened this year as well. Right? Russia doesn't have dormant democratic institutions. They've been destroyed. There's nothing to jump-start. Right? Uh, so there is... Um, that hope may have been misplaced, but it was there. And that hope was taken away when Putin claimed the 63% of the vote. And then, uh, so the, the, reward, the hope is the reward part of the equation. And then there's the cost part of the equation, which, is, which, which changed profoundly after May 6, 2012, when people were first beaten up. And then random people were arrested. And it's very important that they were random people. They're not leaders of the protests. They're not speakers at the protests. There were random people who were picked out and sentenced to jail time 
for having been there or suspected of being there. Some of them weren't even there. And so what that communicates to people is that, look, you can go to a protest, but you risk everything. You're not guaranteed of going to jail. Most of you will not go to jail. But anyone who goes to a protest at that moment risks absolutely everything. Risks being arrested and being sent to a Russian jail you know, for a term of up to 10 years. Right? Um, so the cost is, is completely out of you know, this world. And the reward is a symbolic gesture and looking at the fa in the faces of people who think like you do, which is no small thing in an isolated and atomized and totalitarian society like Russia, but it's an awfully high price to pay. The fact that uh, with something like the Peace March in Russia in September, 20,000 people were willing to pay that price, that's remarkable. You know, that's huge. But 20,000 people are not going to be able to affect change in Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you said, in the past few years, we've seen an increase in Russian aggression in the form of forcible land annexation, West, uh, increased military exercises in the western border of Russia, and so forth. I'm interested in know, to know uh, what you think the role of the United States and NATO should be in the, uh, responding to this further Russian aggression. Right. Um, so I think uh, you know, my, my job as a journalist is not to dictate policy. I'm not qualified to do that. My job as a journalist is to criticize policy. I'm qualified to do that. So, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what I think is wrong with the conversation. What I think is wrong with the conversation is very interesting. Uh, it's that the conversation is based on the, on the fallacy that NATO and the United States can do something that will change what Putin is doing. Thank you so much. Uh, that's not true. Putin is not affected by sanctions, and I can, you know, it's very easy to see. Like, uh, let's backtrack a few months before the sanctions were imposed, when the West was still facing a choice. You know, what does the West do? If the West does nothing, then Russia sees that it's weak and escalates. If the West imposes sanctions that really affect the Russian economy, then Putin risks losing some popularity. So what does he need to do? He needs to escalate. And if there is a military response, then obviously Russia needs to escalate. So, you know, tr three crude options, and I don't see any, you know, th any others th 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 outside the spectrum, uh, and they all lead to escalation. Putin is on a path to escalation, that's not going to change. Unfortunately, that cannot be a part of political conversation. In, uh, you know, in personal conversations, we know that there are people that we cannot change, they're intractable people, there are people that we can also only try to sort of step away from and try to limit the damage. But in political conversation, we insist on this fallacy that it is actually possible to change the course that somebody has set himself on. And that's not true. Uh, and I think that uh, NATO and the United States need to introduce impossibility into the political conversation and then see where it gets us. Thank you. Thank you for speaking tonight. Thank you. Um, this is probably not going to be a new question. Um, that's right. But <laughs> I wanted to ask about uh, your thoughts about the role of social media in organizing um, political and social action in Russia. I mean, we've seen uh, large-scale social movements all over the world, not just in Arab Spring, not just in Ukraine, also in Hong Kong, also in South America, everywhere. Uh, and um, of course, we've seen the uprisings in Russia uh, around the Doom elections. Um, do you think that uh, this, the equation is just very different in Russia and, you know, uh, the increased amount of communication and organization that social media enables just doesn't apply there, the situation is too bleak, or do you think it's, it's still a positive factor? What do you think? Yeah. Um, I think that the equation is not different in Russia, but I think we have to understand the equation. And I think that uh, the way to sum it up is social media speeds speed up communication and social media amplify messages that exist offline. Social media do not exi create connections that don't exist offline and they, don't, they do not create messages that don't exist offline. So in a country where public space has been very effectively destroyed over the course of the last 15 years, before social networks appeared, where those connect social connections were severed, those offline connections were severed, the amount of stuff that can be amplified and speeded up is very, very limited. 
So uh, it, wouldn't be po it wouldn't have been possible to organize the protests uh, of 2011, 2012 without social media. Although there's some interesting, there's some interesting information about those protests because it was only about half the people who learned about the protests from the internet, and it's not really clear how the other half of the people learned about it. But it's offline media, it's word of mouth, it's radio, it's whatever. But um, so they, you know, there were. Uh, I think they were essential, but they were obviously not solely uh, responsible for uh, for the protests. But they couldn't have made the protests even bigger because they were, they're self-limited by the connections that exist offline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I think there's at least one um, rather positive thing that Putin may be responsible for, which is sheltering Edward Snowden. And I would ask you if you agree. Secondly, um, my understanding is that um, and this is not the only uh, way to assess uh, a, a government, of course, but it's my understanding that actually Putin is quite popular in, in Russia. And do you agree that that's a fairly accurate assessment? And to what would you attribute that popularity? And then the third thing is um, Gorbachev, uh, at the, in a recent appearance at the 25th anniversary of the of the fall, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Wait, I'm sorry. Can, can we limit this to two questions? I don't think I can do three. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get okay. back to it because it's maybe the most important. But <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, Snowden. I mean, obviously, uh, s sheltering somebody who's facing jail time uh, is probably a very good thing for that person. Uh, has it been? good for the conversation in this country. I don't think it's been good for the conversation in this country. I think that it might be might have been much better for the conversation in this country if Snowden were facing a public trial. Right? Uh, but that's, you know, that, that's setting aside the, the fate of a human being, which, uh, which is against my principles. Uh, also, Snowden has allowed himself to be used as a propaganda puppet in exchange for this renewable temporary asylum contract. That, I think, is a tragedy. Because if he is, you know, if he's a contradictory figure in the first place, having play, uh, confronted one problematic uh, state and then handed himself over as a propaganda puppet to a much more problematic state, really undermines his credibility. So um, that's on Snowden. Uh, no, uh, Putin's popularity. Putin's popularity is is is, is a really fascinating topic because uh, if 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 we look at it, um, you know, if we look at March 2012, right? He got uh, he claimed 63 percent of the vote. In fact, he got about 50 percent of the vote. 50 percent of the vote sounds like a lot, until you consider the fact that there was nobody running against him. Right? There were four figureheads on the ballot, and none of them campaigned. So nobody was actually voting for any of those people. People were voting against Putin. 50% protest vote is a lot of lack of popularity for a leader who controls the media entirely, right? Fast forward two years to March 2014. His popularity rating was about 86%. So how do you explain that? Well, to explain that, you have to look at the nature of public opinion in an authoritarian country. Right, uh, and there's a common misconception that you know when you when you raise the issue of, of public opinion in an authoritarian state, people immediately say, "Oh, so people are lying." No, people are not lying. People have been conditioned over generations in Russia to know that knowing which way the wind is blowing is a matter of survival. They are sincerely expressing what needs to be expressed, what is essential to their survival at that minute. I know that there are people who were at the protests in 2011-2012 who are now Putin supporters and are happy that Crimea was annexed. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not particularly interested in what that means for their psychic well-being. The only way in which it's important uh, to us is what does this mean for public opinion? It means that public opinion can turn on a dime. You know, and we've seen this happen in other authoritarian countries where uh, you see, you know, everybody's supporting a leader, a dictator, until they don't the next day. You know? uh, that could happen. 
So what do you make of Gorbachev's statement at the Berlin um, celebrations that um, Putin has actually been a moderating, uh, his stance has been a, a moderate one, and the whole discourse about... Yeah. I'm sorry, I, di I, didn't, I didn't read the statement in yeah. Russian, so I can't answer. I would just be responding and, what and you're saying, the, to what you're saying. I'm, I'm going to have to keep you to okay. two questions, right. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. My name is Leonid Sidorov. I have a dual Russian-American citizenship. And my two questions are about your comments. Uh, first of all, uh, how can you comment on the choice of Putin as the most influential person by Forbes magazine? And that's, I think, two years in a row or something. And the second, maybe it's a little irrelevant, I would like you to comment on the situa current situation at Radio Liberty. Please, no, no comments, just questions. Well, question. <laughs> okay. what, what's the okay. current situation? I don't know. I don't know anything about the current situation at Radio Liberty. But uh, I, uh, I mean, there's an, there's an argument to be made about Putin being the most influential person. I don't know that there's an argument to be made for putting, putting Putin on the cover of Forbes. Uh, but certainly, I think that probably no one has influenced <laughs> Uh, the you know, the state of war and peace in the world in 2014 more than Putin. Okay, thank you. But aren't you working for Radio Liberty no. now? Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, not to go back to the question that the gentleman before the last gentleman asked, but um, I wanted to know a little bit more, what do you think uh, explains seemingly intellectual people, at least in the past, uh, now following, uh, following Putin and idolizing him uh, as much as all the other sheep and the rest of the country? How, how can that be explained? Um, I don't know, you know, who you mean specifically. I might have specific comments about specific people, but in general, I think that um, there's there's a real pleasure to be had in being on the side of power, and it's really exhausting to be to to always feel, uh, you know, a minority of one or at best one plus your two or three best friends, uh, and um, maybe it's it's a way of of seeking some psychological rest uh, and, and intellectual relaxation. <laughs> Thank you. And my second question is this. Um, what, what Masha did not mention is that in the uh, former Soviet Union, sex actually did not exist. It's, it's, it's a wonder that children were it's created. It's a wonder that I exist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do you think uh, the state of the country goes from non-existence of sex to an over-sexualized culture uh, to not being able to talk about any other kind of sex than the traditional kind of the straight sex. You know, it, that's actually, I mean, there, is like, there are books and books to be written about that. It's fascinating. Uh, and a couple have been written, but not nearly enough. I mean, I think that the um, that part of what makes an effective totalitarian state is that some things have to be set in stone and some things have to be in constant flux because you have to keep the population uh, in, in a state of tension. There are things you have to be following and you always have to know what the party line is on a in a particular area at any given time. So like the party line on uh, Marxism and Leninism remained unchanged, but the party line on the family changed every decade or so, right? So first the family was abolished, then marriage was re uh, reintroduced, then divorce was illegal, and abortion was outlawed, then illegitimate children, children were re-legitimized, and effectively polygamy was, uh, was legalized because men were encouraged to have as many children as possible with as many different women as possible. To that end, women uh, were encouraged to have, ch uh, the single motherhood was, was supported. You could um, legitimize what had, you, what had considered, been considered illegitimate. Uh, 
then uh, uh, you know, then then we get into the post-Soviet era where um, where yes, it's a hypersexualized culture. Then the switch is thrown again, and we're talking about only traditional sex. But this is one of those areas where you have to always be on your toes. You know, everything that has to do with sex, the bedroom, and the family. You know, you have to be on track, or you're risking a lot. So, in that sense, that's also a very good choice of uh, of a building block of ideology, because that's you know because people know to be paying attention to that. Thank you. We're coming to the end of our time, so I'd ask everybody who's in line to ask just one question each, please. Yes, if I could um, frame my question in terms of a, a hypothetical counterfactual. Uh, going oh, I love those. <laughs> in turn. At the time of the, um, the time of the, the late 80s, early 90s, when the Soviet Union was in the throes of its collapse, it, it appeared it, it, it to be a golden opportunity for the West <clears throat> to begin to use its suasion and its resources in a way to evolve in terms of consistent with um, you, you know the discourse of reform, the discourse of glasnost, the discourse of perestroika, the paradigms of, um, of, of uh, Gorbachev at that time. The fact is that the West began to move its NATO military um, institutions right into Eastern Europe, right into the backyard of, of Russia. At the same time, they began to get involved with the domestic politics in Ukraine and Georgia. At the same time, the United States, it, when it was, while it was fat and sassy, while the, and, the, and, the, and, and Russia was in the throes of its debacle, the United States unilaterally abrogated the ABM Treaty, one of the, you know, one of the really um, signature uh, settlements in terms of nuclear stability, nuclear strategic stability. Do you think that possibly if the West had handled uh, you know, the, the, tra the Russian transition differently, that possibly Putin would not have been created. Possibly there would have been a, a more of a Gorbachev. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, I have things to say about that. Uh, I, I, I want to be very careful because I think that there, uh, while there is a kernel of truth to, to that argument, it's been abused in the last few months especially, right? Uh, and the way that has been abused is that uh, you know, there there have been a series of articles that say, well, the, the what has provoked Putin is NATO expansion into Russia's backyard, which um, which is a really weird uh, uh, argument that does two things that really drive me nuts. One is it pretends that Putin has no agency of his own, and while I don't think he has much of a an intelligence or you know an ability to think strategically, he certainly has agency, and he certainly uh, makes his decisions uh, based on what he wants and not reactively to NATO. In fact, the West is much more reactive to Putin than Putin has been to the West. Right. So that's one misconception in that argument. The other misconception, uh, which is much more important and which I find truly insulting, is that Ukraine doesn't exist. Right, um, because that idea that it's Putin's backyard, uh, th which is very much the idea that, that the Kremlin has been promoting, and the idea that you know the Kremlin has uh, valid strategic interests uh, in Ukraine, and that's why it's there, uh, it requires forgetting that there are 45 million people in Ukraine who actually have rather loudly said many times over what they want. And a, ma a clear majority of them appear to want to have NATO protection, just as the Baltic states wanted to have NATO protection. You know, unlike, for example, Finland, which until recently didn't seem to particularly want NATO protection. Now it may change its mind. Um, so, um, you know, so if we, uh, just with these two caveats that uh, let's not forget that Ukraine exists uh, and that Putin has agency, I think that there was a major, major misstep uh, made by the United States in 1999 that enabled the rise of nationalist politics in, in Russia. I don't know that, uh, whether it would have happened otherwise or, or not, but I think it's, it's huge. And that is when the United States began the bombing of, of, uh, of Kosovo and, um, and, and the rump Yugoslavia, while 
Evgeny Primakov, the then uh, Prime Minister of Russia, was on his way uh, to the United States. Uh, and uh, he, at that time, this was uh, March 1999, he actually turned his plane around over the Atlantic and flew back to Moscow, aborting the negotiations, setting back U.S.-Russian relations, you know, years, um, enabling uh, and revitalizing, really, nationalist politics in Russia. And, and it really was incredibly insulting uh, for the United States not to even pay lip service to uh, to, to seeking Russian consultation on Yugoslavia. So. Thank you. Um, right around the, uh, actually before the Sochi Olympics, there was a lot of discussion about um, the anti-gay um, laws in Russia, and there was a lot of discussion in the U.S. about what should be done in response to it, um, whether it was boycotting vodka or whatever else. Um, and I'm wondering, um, what are your thoughts on what what uh, would have been the best thing uh, for the community in the West to do? Um, and then looking forward, six months, 12 months, 18 months, is there anything that, that folks outside of Russia can do to support what we call the gay community? Or is there really nothing that can be done? Political asylum. And political asylum. And more political asylum. Uh, I mean, Things are not going to get better in Russia for a long, long time. Uh, the um, the anti-gay legislation in itself is not particularly meaningful. It's one uh, of a number of uh, laws designed for random uh, application. The danger posed by those laws is not huge. You know, uh, it, they're not even like the laws that are about to be passed in Kyrgyzstan, uh, which actually send, will send people to jail. You know, it's a fine. It's a, it can be a backbreaking fine, but still, it's money. The problem was with the anti-gay campaign that has been on television for the last nearly three years, uh, that the anti-gay legislation is only sort of the legislative expression of. And that campaign is a campaign of incitement to violence that has resulted in major violence uh, against gay people, people who are perceived as sympathizers, people who are perceived as like they might be gay, or gender nonconformist, <coughs> etc. That's not going away. And those people don't need you know, financial or political support. They need a safe haven. Um, now, there's been a huge influx of LGBT refugees to this country from Russia. Uh, Immigration Equality, which is the organization that provides the, uh, legal aid to, to, to asylum seekers, had to hire a full-time Russian-speaking paralegal uh, earlier this year. And they're still behind on intake. Um, now, I've, um, I've run away from Russia twice, uh, once uh, the, with my parents. Thank you, Pop. Uh, and um, when I was 14, we came here as, Soviet, as re Jewish refugees from the Soviet Union. We had group status as Jewish refugees. We, had, we were uh, entitled to public assistance the moment we landed here. My parents had the right to seek employment the moment we landed here. Uh, it was still really, really hard, but it was a soft landing. People who come here uh, as refugees from Russia now, as LGBT refugees, do not have uh, the right to claim group status. They come here on tourist visas. They have no right to anything for at least the first year. Then they get the, the right to seek employment, but they still can't seek public assistance. They don't even, by and large, they can't even seek the assistance of resettlement agencies because resettlement agencies get federal funding, and that means they can't help people who don't have status. So we have already seen uh, refugees from Russia end up homeless in New York. Uh, and I was part of an effort to lobby the State Department to create group status for LGBT refugees. We failed. Uh, and um, so you know, the, uh, the best way to help LGBT refugees is to help them look for work, to help them find housing, uh, and ultimately to, f to, to get group status because the people who are most vulnerable people who have children in Russia don't feel like they can leave because uh, th they can't you know, live for a year out of status in, in this country. So. Thank you. And our last question. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my question is about Pussy Riot. Um, as I understand it, Putin has done a very good job at making Pussy Riot sort of the clowns in the opposition and poking fun at them to decrease their um, popularity in Russia. Uh, uh, what degree do you see the visibility and the popularity of Pussy Riot um, in Russia as opposed to in the West? And how do you think this will change now that Nadia and Masha are touring around the rest of the world talking about prison rights? Um, 
with, will their relevance change in Russia or in the US? You know, I think they're, they've had an extraordinary impact. Uh, and I mean, they obviously didn't bargain for what they got. They, uh, when they, uh, I mean, first of all, they identified as performance artists, mm -hmm. uh, contemporary art, uh, protest artists. They weren't addressing a mass audience with their protests. Mm -hmm. They were basically addressing two audiences when they went into the cathedral. They were addressing uh, the contemporary art scene, and they were addressing the protest scene. And and then they ended up being you know re uh, broadcast on television over and over again. I mean, with an absolutely perverted message, but they found themselves addressing a mass audience when that's not what they had in mind. That actually created, especially for Niza, that really created a a, uh, a crisis of, of of faith because she thought, well, their message was really ineffective for a mass audience. It may have been pretty good for changing minds in, in a narrow audience, and it really was. It was, it was incredibly effective for, uh, for a smaller audience. But, but she, was, she really was trying to figure out while she was in jail, and we talked a lot about this, uh, you know, how, how, was she, how would she address somebody who's never been exposed to anything but you know, pop? Mm -hmm. Like, should she write pop? Uh, and um, ultimately, I think that that was part of the decision for focusing on traditional human rights activism once they came out of jail. Now, for organizing as human rights activists in Russia, they certainly have a bigger resource than just about anybody uh, aside from Khodorkovsky, and they have the incomparable advantage of being in the country as opposed to being outside the country. So I think their impact has been very, very large. Uh, and certainly the fact that they've been able to pull many current and former inmates into their movement is also quite remarkable. I mean, it's one of the few efforts in Russia, possibly one of two, uh, that have really cut across socioeconomic lines in a, in, a, in a profound way. Now, in terms of their impact on the West, I mean, it was, uh, was huge in the first place. They, I think it's, it can really be compared fairly to Solzhenitsyn, uh, in the sense that you know, Solzhenitsyn, with the publication of the Gulag Archipelago, changed Western public opinion. You know, something that politicians and journalists and political scientists had been unable to do. And, and he did it with the publication of, of an amazing book. I think with their performance, which again I would say began with entering the cathedral and ended with their closing statements in, in court, they did the same thing. They changed public opinion in, in, um, in the West. You know, as someone who goes around all the time talking about Putin, I felt that profoundly. And things that I had been saying for six months uh, at that point since the book came out that seemed sort of edgy and provocative and, and marginal suddenly were mainstream. Not because of my book, but because of Pussy Riot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what they're doing now is they're, you know, in part they're sort of driving that message home, in part they're capitalizing on, on, on that. But I think they've been incredibly smart and effective in the way that they use their access to, 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 to bully pulpits and, and to the media. Yeah. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Marsha Gessen.